Hello guys, how it's going? It's Peter here and in this video I would like to talk about the basics of Guild Wars 1. Uh, in case someone is wondering why and why now, uh, because of two things. Firstly there was a sale on Steam last week, which made probably uh, bring in new players. And secondly I noticed there isn't any useful beginner's guide on YouTube either about this game and I think it really deserves one. Uh, I made this guide mostly for total beginners, but if you are not a beginner, I think you can, you might be able to learn something new as well. And uh, but yeah, this is for someone who has no experience with this game. Okay, let's get started. First of all, let me begin with some background information about the game. Uh, Guild Wars is a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, in brief just an MMORPG, and it's developed by ArenaNet and published by NCSoft. Uh, the game is free to play once you buy it, so there is no monthly fees like in um, World of Warcraft for example, and the release date goes back to 2005 April. So, so now Guild Wars is 13 years old when I'm making this video, so basically it's a teenager. <laughs> uh, the, the game consists of three campaigns, uh, we have the Prophecies, eventually the original Guild Wars was the Prophecies, then we have Factions and Nightfall, so we have three campaigns and besides that we have one expansion, this is Eye of the North. So I was checking Wikipedia and I of the North is not a campaign, it, it is just an expansion. Um, and yeah, th there is uh, another, let's say, small expansion, which is basically a series of quests. Uh, and this name is Guild Wars Beyond. And it takes players closer to the events, but what will happen in Guild Wars 2? And as far as I know, you can't uh, get a nice bo box like this. Uh, from the stores anymore. Um, so if you buy the game on the Guild Wars store or on um, Steam, you just get uh, a code and you can make an account, but you, you don't get the box. Okay, so what's the difference in game in the game now and back then? Um, well, obviously the biggest one is the number of players. Uh, I can't tell you guys exact numbers, but nowadays I believe some thousands of people log in daily. A bit more if there is a Steam sale or a big event. And back in the days, hundred thousands of people. Every outpost was full of people. And uh, yeah, another difference is that events are automated. So we have Christmas and Eastern uh, etc. each year at the same time, and, and there are no big game or skill updates anymore. Unless a few of the developers find some time and they do some bug fixes or small minor updates. Okay, so guys, if you downloaded and installed the game, uh, you arrive to this login screen. Um, let me show you how to create your own account first. Click on this uh, create account or add access key option and here just click this create new Guild Wars account and first you need to choose where which area you live in. Doesn't really matter you can play with people from anywhere in the world and just Use the Ctrl C and Ctrl V um, with your keyboard, and you can copy paste the, the card code what you got from the Guild Wars store. Uh, and after that, you make your um, account name uh, and the password. But uh, normally, if you have your uh, if you created your account, then you have to type just your password because this, this option will remember your account name and your um, character name. And on this side of the screen there is um, 
usually a notification about the upcoming uh, events in the game. So once you've filled uh, these three bars you can log in and we actually arrive to the character selection screen. So normally if your account is new you only see empty character slots. If you only bought prophecies then you have four empty slots if you bought factions or nightfall then you get only two but if you have purchased all of the campaigns then you get eight character slots and here you can do a bunch of things you can edit your account uh, you can change the address the email address the password uh, and you can add more access case if you want and uh, uh, you can enter the Guild Wars store um, or you can sort your character names and uh, you can you can look around this area if you press the right button on your mouse and, and that's it you can create or delete characters okay so let's create a character together um, you have two options and these two options are really important uh, because the PvP only character is player versus player mode so if you are unexperienced in the game and you start PvP only then you might have a bad bad taste about the game that's why I recommend you to start with the role playing character first it's called PvE player versus environment and and first just complete the, the main story um, have some friends and, and make some builds and after that you can play PvP if you are more experienced and, and anyway your PvE character can play PvP as well so it, it's not a big deal um, here you will see the, the campaigns, what you have purchased. If you have all, then you see Prophecies, Factions and Nightfall. From Prophecies you can create 6 professions. Um, I don't want to cover this topic in this video. There is a small description about each of the professions. Uh, so, But I don't want to convince you which one to use, which one not. Uh, Perhaps in the next video I will. Mm, but anyway, a profession defined, a character, skills, attributes, armor, and general appearance, just like in any other RPG games. Every character starts with the primary profession and later in the game they gain uh, the secondary professions. For example, a warrior can't wear the same armor that monk can and vice versa. Also unique to each profession is a primary attribute which is only available to characters who choose that primary. Just a few words about the professions now. Warriors have high armor, they are melee and they use either axe, sword or hammer. Rangers can have a pet which fights along them and they can attack from great distances with bow and can make traps. Monks can heal or protect their allies with spells or enchantments. Um, necromancers can make hordes of minions and they like to curse their enemies. Mesmers are great to control enemies with hexes and they cost spells faster than others. Elementalists rely on powerful elements like the fire, water, air and earth. Their energy is the biggest of all professions. Assassins wield deadly daggers and can use fancy shadow stepping skills to get out of tough situations. Uh, ritualists summon spirits and they are good healers too. Paragons has the highest armor just like the warriors and they are the engine of the team uh, because they can help their allies with shouts, echoes and their preferred weapons are the spears. Dervishes can turn into avatars of the gods and their sight hit three enemies at a time. And from factions you can play the assassin and the ritualist. 
So you can't you can't play the the assassin and the Richu from any other campaigns, just from factions. And the same same goes with Nightfall. And you can play the Paragon and the Dervish only from Nightfall. But you can play the the six uh, base professions from any of the campaigns. Okay, let's try. Let's see a Paragon now. Of course, you can choose your gender, male or female, and you can customize the, the body of your character. Uh, and you should pay attention for that because if you want to change it later, you have to pay quite a lot of money for that. Um, you can color the, the armor of your character. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because later in the game as you level up you need to buy uh, other sets of armor anyway and, and you will change the, the, the color as well and, and here if you uh, left click this area then then you can uh, customize the the height of your character and finally the character name um, let's try Beginner's Guide. Yeah, and that's it. The first loading is usually takes longer because you, your computer has to download all the files. It really depends on your um, internet speed. If you have a good good speed, then it may be just five minutes. But uh, back in the days. Um, at home I had very slow internet and it took me hours. Um, usually there is, a in, there is an intro about the, the background story of the, the campaign you are in. Um, yeah, you should watch it at least once to have some knowledge about the, the story and the, and the world. But I will skip it now. So guys, before we start any serious stuff, let me show you a few things about the interface. Uh, the default interface looks like that. And these red bars here are the party window. Um, it is useful to be aware of the team's head. So I don't recommend you to, 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 to turn it off. Um, this square right here is the minimap. Personally, I like to display it while doing PV stuff, but you can play without it too. Um, use it if you feel lost or something. Um, these numbers from 1 to 8 are your skills, um, your skill bar. Uh, in Guild Wars you can only use a maximum of 8 skills at a time, but uh, trust me, those will be more than enough. Um, damage monitor, or the damage you take or receive. Uh, the pink number show show how much damage you how much damage the monsters or other players do against you and the yellow number are the damage you do. Uh, the red bar on the top middle section is your target. Um, as you do damage the red bar gets smaller and smaller and it gets empty then you defeated your enemy. Uh, this other red bar here uh, is your health bar or your health points um, and the blue is your energy. In, in Guild Wars most of the skills require some energy to use and those small arrows so, uh, shows how much health or energy regeneration you have. Uh, I will um, explain that later. Um, this area here is the chat area. Messages from other players or information about drops um, appear here. Um, yeah, I will talk about that later as well. The next one is the experience bar, which also shows your actual level. Uh, as you can see, my character here is level 19. Um, as you finish quests or defeat enemies, you gain experience and the bar fills up. When it reaches uh, the maximum, then you level up. Um, this area here is the skills that affects you. Um, 
it can be either good or bad. And finally, these are the weapon sets. Um, you can have maximum four of them, and it's it's a great tool for changing weapons quickly. The interface is a bit different in Outposts because there is an extra area, uh, the district panel. It's located in the upper left corner. Um, there is a maximum number of players in Outposts in every district. It's 100. If more and more people visit the same area, which is pretty common during events, then the game creates new districts. Um, nowadays, American English district is the most populated, uh, so if you feel alone, go there, and I think you will find more players to play with than anywhere else. Uh, back in the day, some outposts had over 200 districts, and it was really hard to reach District 1 in Kamadan, which, which is the main trading city still now. Uh, I know some of the players like to create their own interface. To do that, go to the down left corner, click on the menu and find the options, or simply click F11 on the keyboard. Uh, in the options menu you can do you can change many things, but now let's just go to the interface panel. As you can see the game assigned the screen into yellow squares. These, these are basically what I was talking about uh, so far. Uh, here you can really make the screen look like your own taste. The, drag the corner of the squares, move them, uh, resize them, you can rotate them as much as you want. Uh, but if you prefer the original screen, click on default settings and everything goes back to normal. If that's not enough for you, you can make the screen elements disappear with unticking them in the menu. Otherwise, if you press uh, Ctrl plus Shift plus H together, so these three um, letters together, you can really make nice screenshots because all the all the screen elements disappear instantly. Okay, now that you created your new own character, you should learn the basic movements. Um, press and hold the right mouse button and you can rotate the camera. With the left mouse button you can move your character or you can talk to NPCs, pick up objects, use skills or items and many other things. So with the left mouse button you can do a bunch of things. Moving of your characters can also be done with the WASD letters or with the direction arrows and uh, pressing Q or E helps dodging attacks. Uh, the U letter is the minimap. Scroll wheel button on the mouse is mostly for zooming in and out. The, uh, the L letter is the quest dialog panel all the quests you pick up will be displayed here, and if NPCs have a green mark above their heads, it means that they have a quest for you. K letter is to check your attributes and skills. I letter is the inventory. F1, F2, F3, F4 letters are to change weapons quickly. And to display the, the weapon sets, you need to tick the, the, the weapon sets in the inventory. Pressing the Alt letter displays all the objects, NPCs or other players. Double left click is basically equipping a weapon or following a teammate and it depends on what you target. And M letter is the world map. And letter is the friend list, you cannot friends, or if someone really annoys you, you can ignore him with the ignore list. X letter is to turn around. Y or Z letter is basically to look behind, it's different on some keyboards. Space letter can be an attack, following a teammate or NPC, it depends on 
what you target. The numbers from 1 to 8 are to use skills or you can also click on skills. Uh, I will explain more in the combat topic. Gilator shows your guild. You can see who is who was online, for how long they haven't logged in, who joined the, the guild and who is in the alliance. Escape is useful for stopping your own skill or to close some specific windows on the screen. F5, F6, F7 and F8 are just to open your inventory bags and F9 to display all of the bags at the same time. F11 letter is the options menu and F12 is to log out. If you press the Z button you can display all your minions or spirits. The zero number is to show the chat window or to hide it. The T letter is to target other people's target. The tabulator is to change a different target. The B letter is useful in outposts to observe some PvP matches. Uh, the enter key is, is useful for typing, uh, to sending messages. The age letter shows your titles and some information about your account achievements. The F letter is basically to target yourself. The C letter is the closest target. The left control shows all enemies and the right control button helps you with language issues uh, as it turns the interface back to English while you press it. Ok, so you know the interface, know the controls, you are ready to do something. Once you leave an outpost, the game creates your own instance. It is kind of like your own, your own copy of the area. And only party members who joined you before entering this area will be with you. But don't worry, it's a good thing because others can't steal your drops or they can't kill monsters before you. Ok, so how can you attack a monster or something? First of all you need a weapon to be able to attack. The very first quest will provide you with some beginner weapons. All you have to do is equipping one of them. Uh, go to your inventory, double left click and then you can use them. Basically to attack an enemy you need to target it first. It can be done either by left click or by the C letter which targets the closest enemy or with pressing the tabulator button or simply pressing spacebar. Uh, if you are close enough for an enemy, it also works. Uh, notice how the game gives me an auto target here.
it tries to hit you but it can't and this way you don't suffer any damage. Quite many of the professions have blocking skills but rangers and warriors are really good at this. If your enemy blocks your attack a small block text appear above the target's head and in PvP blocking is especially useful. Uh, in the game most of the skills give a percentage of block and they stack multiplicatively so if a skill gives you 50% chance to block and another skill, skill gives you another 50 you won't get 100% chance to block just 75. Usually miss happens if you are blind or if you are suffering from a hex. Blindness gives 90% chance to miss a text and projectile spells also have a greater chance to miss. Being obstructed means that physical object is between you and your target. Conditions are a type of negative effect that is mostly caused by a skill unless there is an environment effect like a poisonous swamp or or lava and, and you get burning. Conditions are extremely useful in PvP and every condition has its own sign on the target's health bar and if you are suffering from one it's visible in the top left corner. Conditions has a duration after they simply disappear and in theory you could make infinite long conditions but in reality the game doesn't let you to do that after 12 hours uh, they simply stop. Most of the conditions cause some health degeneration. Uh, anyway the ma maximum regeneration and degeneration of health and energy is, is 10 but you won't see that often in the game. Some skills can help you with that. For example body's power boosts energy regeneration and shield of regeneration gives a nice uh, health point regen. Ok, let's see what conditions we have in the game. I already mentioned the blindness, which can take out melee characters easily. Besides that we have the poison, which causes minus 4 health uh, degeneration. Uh, flashy creatures can bleed too, that's the bleeding. It means minus three health regeneration. Um, then we have the burning. It is the best uh, degen condition with minus seven uh, degeneration. Uh, then we have the disease. It's an interesting condition as it as it can spread from one creature to another of the same time uh, with minus four degen. Crippled is is a useful condition to slow down enemies because crippled creatures move 50% slower. Weakness is effective against melee characters as it reduces attribute points by 1 and the base damage by 66%. Uh, look how much difference weakness can make on incoming damage uh, in this video. Uh, although the, the reduced damage is just base damage from your weapons and not from the attacking skills. Cracked armor can reduce the armor of your opponent by uh, minus 20, but it can't reduce it lower than 60, which is the, the caster's armor. Deep wound is good for lowering your target's health by 20% and healing eff effects by 20%. Dazed condition can be deadly on coaster professions as all spells take twice as long as to cost and all spells are easily interrupted. And here we arrive to the interrupting skills. Uh, what is exactly an interrupt? It's an action which prevents an opponent from completing their current action. If someone interrupts your character by using skills the character stops for a split second and the activation bar stops too and you can't use your skills till it's not recharged. 
Mesmers and, and the Rangers are very good at interrupting. And there are many skills which can uh, interrupt uh, other skills. And finally, one of the best shutdowns uh, is knocking enemies down. It causes skills or actions to stop and your opponent can't move while the knockdown is uh, still alive. In Guild Wars there is a max duration for being knocked down. The base duration is ten 2 seconds, but it can be extended to 4 seconds. Uh, and some, some of the creatures are immune to knockdown. Ok guys, there is one more thing I haven't talked about in the combat topic. And it's what happens if you die, because you can die in the game. Um, there are basically two options. The first is dying in uh, explorable areas. In this case you get resurrected after a few seconds and you receive a death penalty. It causes your energy and health to decrease um, a bit. And, and you can die uh, several times till you reach uh, minus 60. The other option is dying during missions. Here there is there are no rest shrines and you have to start it over unless uh, someone in your party has uh, resurrection skills. Um, if you kill a boss you get the opposite of the penalty. Your energy and health increases a bit and it's a boost from a, from a morale boost. As I said earlier, you can use a maximum of 8 skills at a time. The 8 skills in your skill bars is called a build. You can send your build to anyone, share in the chat or save other players builds too. Press K and click on that small blue floppy, floppy like icon. Now click on template code and there send to chat. And place it somewhere in the chat window. Don't try it uh, in the all and in the trade channels, uh, the, builds, the build codes doesn't work there. Go back to the blue floppy icon and save your build with the save to template option. Anyway, Guild Wars makes TXT files about the builds, so if someone gives you their TXT files, you can copy paste the files into your own Guild Wars directory. Alright, let's jump to the skill types now. Mm, but before we start that, few information about how skills work in the game. Most of the skills require some energy to use. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a base energy regeneration of every profession. It's either 2, 3 or 4, depending on your profession. The bigger the energy region, the faster you, you gain back energy. Warriors and Paragons have just 2 energy regeneration, Rangers 3 and other professions have 4 pips of uh, regen. Each pip of uh, regeneration uh, generates one energy every three seconds. Costing time is a duration of a skill to be executed. If you use a skill, you need to wait some time before you can reuse it. That's the recharge time. Okay, so we have these skill types. Attack skill can be ranged or melee or a pet attack. Blessings are typically granted by some NPCs for some money. And gi they give you some extra HP or some extra HP regeneration and other bonuses. Chant is a paragon only skill which gives a one time benefit to either one or all of the members of the party within earshot range. And, and I mentioned earshot now, uh, so look at this picture, these are the skill ranges the different uh, the ranges. 
these guys, it changes the, the appearance of characters. Black Titan mission is a good ex example for that, or some tonics. Echo, it's a paragon only skill, similar to chance, gives some benefit for, for an ally. Elite skill, the strongest skills in the game, you can have only one in your build at a time. Most of the builds are based around their elite skills, and elite skills are obtainable either from bosses with the signet of capture, or from elite tomes, and they have a special visible mark in the skill bars. Environment effect. For example, if you walk into the lava, you get burning, or if you go into the swamp, you get poison. Um, forms. Dervish professions has the most. They can use the av avatar of the gods, but there are other forms too. Glyphs are typically elementally skills which affect in a positive way your next spell or your next spells and you can only have one glyph at a time. Party bonus is obtainable by experience scrolls and gives some extra experience for the kills. Preparation is a ranger skill which makes bow attacks stronger in a way, and your character can ho only have one preparation at the same time. Ritual, there are two types of rituals, one is the ritualist binding rituals, which usually attacks the enemies and protect allies. Only one of the same spirit can be active in spirit range. And the other type is the ranger's nature rit rituals, which provide a global effect for both enemies and allies. Shouts have no activation time, you can use them during activating other skills or while being knocked down. Most of the shout uh, skills belong to paragons and warriors. And then we have the spells, which are basically most magic skills are spells, and they have many subtypes. Enchanted creatures have a visible cloudy wing around them, and enchantments has a yellow triangle in the party window. Hex spells has a negative effect on the opponent for a period of time. Uh, hexes can be easily noticed by the dark cloud ring and by a purple arrow pointing downwards in the party window. Item spell is a skill that creates a bundle, a small urn that is held in the coaster's hands and they cause an effect while held or, or when dropped, and only ritualists have item spells. War spells are mostly elementalist skills, which create a magical area, which provides magical protection for the allies or harm enemies for a period of time. Weapon spells provide a temporary boost on their target's weapon, it changes the model of the target's weapon and it has its own symbol in the party window and ritualists have most of the weapon spells. Vast spells require a flash corpse, so it's a skill of necromancy. It has a visible green ring on the ground around the exploited corpse. Stance is a type of skill which has no activation time and each character can have only one stance at a time. Usually they boost the owner in a way, blocking speed boost, increase the attack speed, mm, stances belong here. Traps are ranger skills which can kill mobs quickly. Uh, they are invisible unless enemies trigger them and by pacing them your character is easily interruptible and they last for 90 seconds. And finally we have the PvE only skills, which are mostly skills
skills that you gain from doing quests and they get stronger as you reach higher ranks in some of the titles and you can have only free PV only skills at a time. In Guild Wars, the rarity of weapons specify their damage, value, potential power, so basically everything. There are 4 levels of rarity. The white weapons are common items without any upgrades or modifiers. Then we have the blue weapons, which are still common but has some low range mods. Then we have the purple items, which are uncommon, but usually they are not max damage. And finally, there are the gold weapons, which are rare, and their damage is max or close to max. Oh, and since this video will be too long anyway, I can't cover the weapon upgrade topic here, but check out this on Wikipedia if you are interested. Uh, these are the possible weapon mods. Besides that, we have two other types of rarity. Green weapons or unique weapons, which have perfect stats or modifiers, with a very few exceptions. Usually bosses drop them or dungeon chests. And finally we have the red colored weapons, which are basically PvP reward weapons. Anyway, rarity is typical not just for weapons, but runes, mini pets, and many other items too. Okay, let's focus on weapons now. Like I said earlier, to use a weapon, all you have to do is double click in your inventory. There are three main weapon types. Melee, ranged, and offhand. Axe, sword, dagger, hammer, and sight belong to melee. Using them requires to be close to the target. Spears, bows, wands and staves can hit from big distances. And focus items and shields are offhand weapons. Every weapon has its own attacking speed and base weapon damage, but it can be increased or reduced by some positive or negative effects. For example, some hex spells decrease the target's attacking speed, while some stances can increase it. Anyway, there is a customization option at uh, any weaponsmith's NPC, which provide an extra 20% base damage boost uh, to your chosen weapon, but be careful guys, once the weapon is customized, other players can't use it anymore. Uh, and here we arrive to the runes. Rune is a type of upgrade component uh, for armors. They have three rarity types, the minor, the major and the superior. Uh, eventually blue, purple and gold runes we have in the game. Some of the runes are professor specific, for example, even though you can buy any of the runes from the rune trader with your mesmer, but, but you can't put warrior runes on your mesmer's armor and vice versa. 
Some other runes are profession independent and any character can use them, like uh, Vigor, Survivor or Radiant runes. Anyway, there are two ways of getting a rune. The first is buying from a rune trader. Uh, the second is by farming. Uh, anywhere you play in the game you will be run into different armor pieces, but the monsters drop. Uh, pick them up and use an identification kit on them. And then identification kits are available at the merchant, uh, basically in any outpost. It's also true for weapons, when you pick them up off the ground, first they are unknown to you, so basically unidentified. But after you use the, the ID kit, you can, you can see the item stats and mods. Ok, let's continue with the armors now. In PvE, every character starts with a beginner or starter armor. And there are 5 pieces of armor, we have the headgear, a chest, a hand, a leg and the foot armor. As you go on with the missions and quests, you will be forced to buy a stronger one, as the enemies also becomes, become stronger uh, and smarter. Um, but it's easy to do that you will need materials and money. The materials are obtainable from either drops or from the common and rare material traders. Once you have bought the money and the materials, you can buy the chosen armor. And uh, anyway, it's smart to put runes onto your character's armor, as it becomes stronger, gets more health points or energy. To do that, simply double click on the specific rune and apply it to one of your armor pieces. The bigger your armor, the less damage you receive from monsters. Uh, well, that's not true for all types of damage, but for the non-armored ignoring damage types for sure, like elemental and physical damage. When taking damage your character gets hit sometimes on the leg, sometimes on the chest uh, and so on. This table here shows how much chance opponents can hit you on the different parts of your armor. Ok guys, it's pretty obvious as your character defeat monsters, complete quests, it gains experience points or XP in brief. Uh, but what happens when you level up? Uh, your max health point increases by 20 and you get some attribute points too. Uh, the max level in the game is 20, after that uh, characters gain skill points instead of new levels and attributes. With skill points you can buy new skills from skill trader NPCs, they are located in the bigger cities. I think I haven't said anything yet about uh, attributes, so let me fix that now. Almost all skills in the game are associated with attributes. Every profession has 5 or 4 uh, attributes, of one is always a primary. The primary attributes are, are only available for a primary profession. So for example, warriors have the strength, axe mastery, hammer mastery, swordmanship. Uh, of these attributes, strength is their primary attribute and other professions can use strength as, as an attribute. When you level up, you can choose which attribute uh, to make stronger with the gain attribute points. The higher the rank of attribute, the stronger the asso associated skills become. For example, if you are an elementalist and you want to make your fire magic skills stronger, you should put m attribute points to fire magic. There are other ways to further increase your attributes after you reach level 20. 
One is using runes, this fade max attribute is 16 uh, on the headgear. Generally minor runes increase attributes by 1, major runes by 2 and superiors by 3. However, the last two has a price of has loss. Besides that some weapons provide chance for a plus 1 attribute increase uh, while using skills. Some skills also increase or decrease attributes and there are consumables too for that. Concept, Golden Axe, Lunar Blessings, etc. Anyway, the enemies also have a level, but they can go further than players. Some of them can reach above level 30, and if you are trying to kill one of these monsters, they can kill you in a few hits. But in general, if an enemy is way bigger than you in levels, uh, you will have a hard battle and killing an enemy like that is, is difficult but if the monster is a low level you can destroy it easily. Missions and primary quests are, are designed to take players through the story of a campaign. Primary quests are displayed in the quest log, while missions have a specific icon on the world map. Every mission has a primary and a secondary objective. Mm, if, you are, if, you do, if you complete both, it gives credit to some titles, for example the Protector and Guardian titles. Missions are usually harder than other quests in the game and they require a full team to accomplish. However, an experienced player might be able to solve some of the missions. Finishing a mission yields some gold, experience, points and they take players to the next outpost. Every mission includes one or more, intro more intros, which helps you understanding the story of the game. If you are doing missions for the first time, don't skip these, because the game has an amazing story. Anyway, if you are wondering how big the game is, check out the world map. And here we arrive to who should join your party, because by doing quests you will rely on either other players or heroes and henchmen, you can solo it all. First let me talk about henchmen. They are NPCs who are located in outposts and you can easily add them to your party anytime. However, their builds are not so good as other players builds. Uh, the computer controls their skill use and movements, uh, so they are not as smart as a real teammate. I only recommend you to use them if you don't uh, have real players to play with, or if you don't have heroes. Ok, so heroes are much better than henchmen. Firstly, you can customize their builds, you can boost their armor just like your character's armor, um, you can give them stronger weapons and if you don't want to, them to attack, you can use uh, avoid combat. Putting them on guard or fight is also possible. In this case, uh, if you put them on guard, they will defend the party from attacking enemies and if you put them on fight, they will fight any enemy. To get a hero you always need to finish a quest, primary or mission first, otherwise you can get them. Adding, them. adding them into your party is simple, go to the party window and use the add a hero option. Anyway, there are 29 available heroes. You could ask me, ok Peter, but what can I do once I reach level 20? First of all, finish all the campaigns. It takes a few weeks for new players. 
and by doing that you experience the game better and you get more skills too. B but the real fun only begins actually you reach level 20 and uh, once you have completed all the campaigns. Personally I love maxing titles. Um, titles are visible under your character's name and if you check the hero panel uh, you know with the age button you will see uh, there are all your titles and their progression. Back in the days the harder, more grindy ones earned other players respect. Um, in Guild Wars we have many titles, I think around 4 to 5, but I doubt there is one person who mocks them all. Perhaps you will be the, the first one. Usually if you reach 30 max titles you have done basically everything what PvE has to offer. Besides title maxing you can do stuff for the Hall of Monuments, it means getting elite armors for your characters, hero armors, pets, mini pets and some endgame weapons. Ok, what else can you do? There are speed clears which means doing some endgame stuff with the real players as quickly as effectively as possible. Only the most experienced players can do speed clears as these areas punish you easily for enemies. Once you completed one of the campaign's main story, you unlock hard mode on that campaign. When you first start the game, it's normal mode by default, but you can switch to hard mode with one simple click in the party window. But be be careful because the enemies and their builds, attacking speed, movement speed and their intelligence can change radically in hard mode. Especially at low level areas, some mob which is Level 3 for example in normal mode, it will be level 20 plus in hard mode and kill you in a few attacks if you are not prepared. Mm, but anyway doing hard mode stuff is very fun and worth it as you get more good drops, more experience points and you can max new titles. I forgot to tell you about tomes, we have two types, uh, one is normal or regular tome and the other one is the elite tome. These drop only in hard mode and the elite tomes only from bosses. They look like small books in the inventory and good for learning new skills without progressing too much in the game. You can have the build you want even at level 1. The basic currency is gold, 1000 gold is 1 platinum or just 1k. Your character can have a maximum of 100k in the inventory and 1000k in the storage. There is a storage in every outpost uh, where storing weapons, armor, materials, money is easy. Anyway, making money is simple, just pick up what the monsters drop or use identification kit on the runes or weapons and sell the junk to the merchant. Keep the best weapons, weapon mods and runes. Some NPCs will give nice, nice money for them. 
There are quite many NPCs in the game. Merchants, die traders, rune traders, material traders, weaponsmiths and armor crafting NPCs. Few words about trading. Kamadan is the number one trading city. It's located in Nightfall. And if you want to trade, always go to American district. It's where people do their trades. But be careful because some people will try to scam you, especially if you are a beginner. You can price check items on the Guild Wars trade chat website. During a trade you can offer a maximum of 7 items and 100 platinum. If the trade would be bigger than that, people use alternative currencies, either globe of ectoplasm or arm braces. To start a trade, target the person who you want to trade with and click on the small trade button. A new screen will appear, click any item you wish to trade in your inventory and pull it over to the trading screen. After that, if the other player's offer is good enough, simply submit and accept the offer. The events in the game are automated and the game informs you about them at the login screen. Always check them when you are logging in. Many of the consumable items which boost attributes give gives extra movement speed, attacking speed or energy drops only during these special events. Uh, the best events are Christmas, Eastern, Halloween, Kanta New Year and the Anniversary Celebration. Besides events, there are also weekly bonuses, which you should also check occasionally. Because some of them give double rewards for, s for specific quests or double rewards in some titles. There is always a PvP and a PvE weekly bonus active at the same time. They change on Mondays. Guild is a social group where players do things together, well at least if a guild is active. Some activities only available to guild members, for example the guild vs guild battles and the guild chat the guild hall. Your guild's tag is visible after your character's name, if you target yourself you can see it. Although creating a guild costs only 100 gold, fully equipping, equipping a guild hall is a lot of money. To create a guild, talk to one of the guild registrars. Guilds also has a guild cape, and if you don't like your own, you can turn it off from the inventory at the cape st status. There are three guild ranks, the leader, the officers and the member. The leader can kick and invite anyone, while officers can only kick members, but not other officers. The guild leader and the officers can write some short messages, but all members receive after logging in. A guild can have a maximum of 100 members. If you get a guild invitation, simply press G button and accept it. Leaving your guild is done by pressing the small head icon next to your name in the guild window. Alliance is a group of guilds, minimum 2 guilds, maximum 10, and they fight for the same purpose. An alliance is either Karzik or Laxon. These are the two big nations in factions which have been fighting against each other for centuries. Guilds in the same alliance can communicate in the alliance chat and visit each other's guild halls. Okay, so guys, if someone would ask me where I like to spend most of my time in the game, Without doubt, I would say pre-searing. And if I could give you just one advice, go and start your first character from Prophecies campaign and try yourself uh, this area as well. Uh, many people don't know, but this beauty was built just in a short few weeks after the whole game was actually made. And, and it meant to be just a tutorial area with limited content. Um, 
as there is no storage you can use only a starter set of skills but exactly because of this pre-searing became popular once you leave this part of the campaign you can never come back except if you make a new character that's why people maintain permanent pre-characters uh, with which they never leave this area okay so why we love uh, pre-searing mostly because of the community people here are more friendly than anywhere else in the game they like to have beginners um, they like to just talk with each other in the outposts the landscapes are beautiful and if you have a bad day in your life and you want to chill out you can achieve that here easily who would ever want to leave anyway besides that people like to farm uh, charts in the Northlands and uh, and if you reach level 20 here uh, you get a title which is only obtainable in this area and this is this is the legendary defender of Ascalon title but you can display in the hall of monuments too many don't know but this place is also great for making money with purple items char mods, char salvage kits and mini pets so guys what are you waiting for? join us in pre-searing, it's fun! Okay guys, last topic in this video. So I found these websites to be useful during my years of Guild Wars. Uh, you can price check items, ask for help, do trading, find information on these websites. Uh, and also check out this list of abbreviations. Uh, for new players I think it will be useful. Uh, and I really hope this video can still s help someone to better understand the basics of the game. Uh, anyway, the creating of this video was my longest, most tiring project so far uh, and I put a lot of effort into this. So if you like the vid, please give it a thumbs up or tell me your opinions uh, in a comment or share it so maybe new players will see it as well. Uh, and as always, thank you very much for watching and have a nice day.